Thank you. Hello. And thank you to IGSCS for um, inviting me to speak today. So I'm a gynae oncology clinical nurse consultant. I work in um, New South Wales in Newcastle, which is about two hours north of Sydney, and I've been in that position for the last 25 years. So today I'm going to talk to you about how to build a cancer survivorship program, and in particular the, the cancer survivorship program that I run in the centre in which I work. Uh, that's just my disclosures. So we've already heard a little bit, little bit today about what is survivorship. Um, survivorship provides a focus on the health and wellbeing of a person living with and beyond cancer. Um, I, like Dr Schenker, looked up some definitions and it, it is a, a, a wide open space as to the def definition of survivorship. The World Health Organisation uh, defines survivorship care to include a detailed plan for monitoring cancer recurrence and detection of new cancers, assessing and managing long-term effects associated with cancer and its treatment, and services to ensure that the needs of cancer survivors are met. Survivorship is not just something that happens after cancer treatment finishes, um, and as you can see from this diagram, it actually continues across the cancer care continuum from diagnosis right through treatment, follow-up care and end-of-life care. Cancer Australia have um, outlined five, five principles um, that we should include when trying to um, start a, a cancer survivorship program, and they can help to guide the policy and planning and health system um, responses to cancer survivorship. The first one is that there should be consumer involvement and in-person centred care. People affected by cancer should be enabled to be involved in shared decision making and supported self to self-manage according to their own preferences. The second is that care should be delivered according to best practice. People affected by cancer should receive consistent, safe and high quality evidence-based cancer care according to their individual circumstances and needs. So not just a one size fits all, but individualised to each individual patient. Survivorship care should be coordinated. People affected by cancer should receive holistic patient-centred care, which is coordinated and integrated across treatment modalities, providers and healthcare settings. Um, including both public and private sectors, specialist, primary or community-based and not-for-profit not organisations that support patients in survivorship. Care should be delivered in a logical, um, connected and timely manner for optimal continuity and to meet the individual needs of those patients that are affected by cancer. Survivorship should also include support for um, living well. The supportive care needs of, of patients affected by cancer um, are across all the domains that Dr Schenker already discussed, the physical, psychological, spiritual, social, cultural, information needs. They should be assessed and patients should receive appropriate referrals if required to be able to meet the needs of those patients in each of those domains. People affected by cancer should also be supported to make informed healthy lifestyle choices, to promote wellness and to manage treatment-related side effects and comorbidities and to reduce the risk of second recurrent, secondary and recurrent cancers. And the fifth principle is that care should be informed and improved by data. There should be both local and national collection and reporting of key cancer data, including the patient experience and outcome data, as this can provide an indication for what is high quality health care and it can help us influence our health system to make improvements to health services. So these are the principles that should be met when designing a cancer survivorship program. There have been many models of survivorship care um, over time. Traditionally, the consultant-led model of care, which is care by the oncologist um, in a, usually a hospital or um, private room setting, and that's been the mainstay of follow-up care over time. And it usually focuses on surveillance for cancer um, and new cancers with care following what is usually a, a recommended treatment schedule. But this is a non-systematic approach to symptom management and health promotion, and it often leaves survivors with significant unmet needs. There's often also limited communication between this oncologist or the specialist and their primary care pr provider. And with the current workforce issues that are across the globe, um, it's not really a sustainable model of care going forward. And it also, we need to improve it so we can better meet the needs of those cancer survivors. Patients can actually be stratified into low, moderate or high risk groups um, to, and their follow-up care can be based off that stratification and a needs assessment. And pathways of care can then be tailored to the individual patient ba based on their needs and the risk factors that go along with their cancer. 
The next model of care is the shared survivorship care. Oops, sorry. Shared survivorship is usually between the oncologist and their primary health care practitioner, and they can provide women the benefits of having that specialist care as well as the continuity of care with the ongoing primary um, care provider. It can often provide care closer to the home for the patient and also provides greater support for holistic needs, comorbidity management, health promotion and self-management. And it also has the potential to provide safe and effective service delivery model while helping to address the equity of access issues for some patients in particularly patients who are from rural or regional areas, to, to be able to have shared care, not having to go to the major treatment centre um, and be able to share some of that care with their local um, primary health care practitioner can be helpful for those patients. The next model of survivorship care is nurse-led care, and that's care, of course, that's delivered by a specialist oncology nurse. There's a variety of different ways that this can be um, done. It can be part of a hospital-based oncology follow-up. It can be nurse-led consultations that are at the beginning of a transition from the oncology specialist centre to the primary health care um, provider as a shared care model. It can be nurse practitioner-led follow-up or it can be nurse-led care in the primary setting. And through research it's been shown that each of these models of nurse-led care have been both safe and effective and that nurses possess the skills and capabilities to provide this care. Nurses also seem are able to offer holistic and a personalised approach to each individual patient. They recognise and deal with the psychosocial distress, they can coordinate care efficiently and promote behaviour change and support self-management for the women. And patients also report a high level of satisfaction with nurse-led care. The final model of care is patient-led care and this is when a patient initiates an appointment when they need one based on their symptoms and individual circumstances. This is certainly um, being further investigated in the cancer field. And it also helps to empower patients to manage their own condition and plays a key role in enabling shared decision making and supported self-management. There are certain things that we need to do when following up patients with cancer. Early detection of recurrence obviously is the main medical emphasis of follow-up. We also need to identify, monitor and manage the treatment related side effects and comorbidities, whether that be short term immediate effects from their treatment or long term effects that may occur months or even years later. We need to screen, assess and manage supportive care needs of patients, of the individual patient and they need to be patient centred and led by the individual woman. Often these supportive care needs can be assessed using a validated tool like the um, NCCN distress thermometer and um, patient problem checklist. We need to review and update family history information as it comes to hand. So as patients are coming back for follow-up, we need to see if anything's changed in their family, whether there may be some genetic or um, family link that will then lead for patients to have further screening that may be necessary. And we also need to provide holistic care, not just based on the patient's cancer diagnosis, but of, holistically of the whole patient with the comorbidities and other issues that they may bring. And we also need to explore and manage the woman's expectations. What do they want from follow-up? What do they want to find out every time that they come to our um, follow-up appointments? And how often do they want to come? <coughs> Pardon me. And who do they want to, want to be seen by? And what suits them the best? So in our service, um, we looked at endometrial cancer to commence our survivorship program. As you know, endometrial cancer is the fifth most common cancer in women in developed countries, and it's the most common gynaecological cancer in developed countries. 75% of women present with early stage disease. It has a low mortality rate with about 85% five year survival. Women may experience physical, emotional, psychosocial and practical effects from their diagnosis and treatment. And the late effects may occur many months or even years after treatment. We also know that obesity is a major risk factor for endometrial cancer and is also the major cause of morbidity and mortality after treatment and this should be taken into consideration when following up these patients. We stratified our women with early stage endometrial cancer to the low risk group as they have a low risk of recurrence, usually low medical complexity, but they often have high supportive care needs. And this is, these are not always able to be met um, by the oncologists in what is a usual very busy clinic. And therefore we sub 
commenced our nurse led survivorship clinic for low grade endometrial cancer. So, the nurse led survivorship clinic occurs once a week in our clinic, and I run that clinic myself as the clinical nurse consultant. Each patient has an initial um, post operative education visit where I discuss with them their pathology and ensure that they understand what that pathology means, what it means in relation to their risk of recurrence, what to expect from follow up, and then discuss healthy lifestyle choices and then refer on to allied health support if required, such as physio, dietitian, or psychosocial support. We are lucky to have a psychologist that's part of our team that can certainly support our patients um, if they're having um, other psychosocial issues or ongoing psychosocial issues. We, we utilise the NCCN distress thermometer and um, problem checklist to assess their levels of distress and any problems that they may have. And we introduce psychosocial care as a routine part of, of, of care for these patients. So it's not, you need to see the psychologist because we think, you know, you're not coping or something's going wrong. She meets every one of our patients um, as they're going through their treatment and follow up. Following that initial visit, they'll then go on to six monthly um, visits for the first two years, then 12 monthly for the years three to five, and then they're discharged or released to their GP for care up to 10 years. Um, the, and of course, these low risk, risk patients, if they are from a regional or rural area, can also be part of a shared care program where they're seeing us maybe once a year and then seeing their local um, primary health care provider um, at that alternate visit. During those visits, of course, we undertake abdominal pelvic examination, vaginal and speculum examination and regional node palpation. Um, but we're also doing much more than that, as I said, providing holistic care. Women are provided with education, both verbal and written, um, and advised to return if they have any symptoms which may indicate a recurrence such as bleeding, pain, or any change to their bladder or bowel habits. I found that in this nurse-led survivorship clinic, I'm able to provide the time that patients need to deal with the supportive care needs and to provide that patient education that often the oncologist doesn't get a chance to do in what is a busy clinic where they're seeing quite new patients and high-risk patients as well. And of course the important part is correspondence back to the primary care practitioner. So ensuring that a letter goes back to their um, general practitioner or primary care provider after each of those visits so they are kept in the loop as to where the patients are at in their um, survivorship and follow-up. So the survivorship issues, which um, Dr Shankar already um, discussed, of course, are surveillance for recurrence and screening for other cancers, loss of fertility, possibly menopause symptoms if women have had a full hysterectomy, pain, fatigue, distress, anxiety, depression and fear of recurrence, lymphedema, and referring them to a physiotherapist if they need some lymphedema education or management, possibly impaired cognitive function, a decline in mobility and physical function, and of course, healthy living and lifestyle choices. It still amazes me to this day that women with endometrial cancer have little or no knowledge of the, of the um, link between obesity and their diagnosis, and it really comes as quite a shock to them. And obviously it's something that, um, as far as education to the community as a whole, is something that we do need to um, improve on. Um, other issues, for patients who may have had radiotherapy includes sexual intimacy changes and dysfunction and urinary and bowel dysfunction. And if patients have had chemotherapy, possibly uh, peripheral neuropathy. Finally, in relation to shared care or primary care follow-up, since the commencement of my nurse-led survivorship clinic, I've been involved in the development with Cancer Australia of the follow-up care for women with low-risk endometrial cancer, a guide for general practitioners. This guide was developed to assist um, general practitioners or primary care providers in managing aspects of follow-up care and support for women following completion of active treatment for low-risk endometrial cancer. It provides a general guide to appropriate practice to be followed, taking into consideration each individual woman's needs. It outlines what follow-up care should include, which is taking a history, undertaking a physical examination, um, discussing the effects of treatment, the management of comorbidities, secondary prevention of other cancers, and of, importantly, psychosocial care. Um, this guide also comes with a suite of resources for both primary care providers as well as for women. And these can all be found um, on the Cancer Australia website with a the link there on, on the slide. 
So as you can see, there are certainly many models of survivorship care that can be implemented across individual healthcare settings. And you need to assess what is best for your service um, and the best fit for your women. But just remember, change takes commitment and persistence. My, my nurse-led survivorship clinic didn't happen overnight. And it even took me quite a bit to convince one of our oncologists that this was going to be suitable and effective and that I knew what I was doing <laughs> as far as being able to assess, assess patients um, in follow-up and be able to assess for recurrence and know when I need to call them in and escalate anything that I'm concerned about. Um, but I encourage you all to keep at it until you achieve what you want for your women. Thank you. And that's just a little picture of where I live in Newcastle in New South Wales. Thank you.